Hey everyone, and a massive welcome to a live episode here on InfoSec Live, where we give you, our audience, the chance to learn from and interact with our industry's leadership. And a bit of a typo on the intro there. Today, we've got a special BSO experience for you to enjoy with James Binford. But before we get into the show, my name's Simon Linstead. I'm the founder of the InfoSec Live community and also your host for this event today. And before we bring James on, by sharing stories and best practice over the last few months alone has led to nearly 10,000 hours of our content being watched on YouTube by you, our amazing subscribers. So a huge thank you for your engagement. And thanks to your support, it's also led to the launch of our in-person community-driven events in both the UK and the United States with a focus on knowledge sharing, networking, and definitely no sales pitches. Please do check out our events page for more info on future events. The next event is here in the UK on the 25th in Manchester, proudly sponsored by Apex or IQ, and before heading back over the pond to Washington, D.C. at the Cyberbytes Foundation next month. We are still accepting sponsorship inquiries for both our U.K. and U.S. tour dates later this year. We've got an action-packed summer lined up in the U.S., so if you are interested, please, please do drop me a message. Meanwhile, back in the community, Precious, our community director here at InfoSec Live, has been organizing group study sessions, CV resume workshops, networking sessions, job alerts, and so much more. So please make sure you check out the community if you haven't already. And if you'd like to offer some assistance to the community as a mentor, please do reach out to Precious and myself. Let's make a difference to the cybersecurity industry by pulling everyone together. But if you don't have the time and you'd still like to support the wider InfoSec Live community, our scholarship fund, or indeed buy me a cheeky decaf coffee, we do have a few ways you can show your appreciation. First up, the ability to purchase super stickers in the YouTube chat if you'd like your question bumped up to the top and three tiers of membership allowing you to show your support in any way that you can. And I noticed we've had four or five new members since our last show, so a massive thank you to those of you who have joined. But whether you join or not, being here and engaging with our content is what really matters. And if I look at the screen now, there's so many familiar faces and so many new faces in the audience today. Big welcome, Chad. Hello to Art, Carlos, Gary. Um, I can't see any more, but there's loads of you. I know Mike Miller's in there, David Me. So thank you so, so much for coming in. It is your support that really makes a difference. So please like and subscribe. You want to make these interactive and make sure you do drop any questions you may have in the chat. OK, time for Simon to stop talking and get the show on the road. Joined today by James Binford. James is a director and business information security officer at Humana, where he leads the security program for a technology and cloud forward business line. His career focuses on securing digital transformations and making the journey to cloud less painful. And he's built and practiced this skill set at Google, US Bank, Amazon, sorry, Amazon Web Services and KPMG. He's a master's in management information systems from Texas A&M and an MBA from the University of Texas in Austin. Stop rambling, Simon. Let's bring him on. Even made you your own little stinger there. Did you like that? That was awesome. I am so hyped from that intro music. Can we do that again? Let's go. Well, I've got my asthma's playing up. I need to have a little bit of a breather. But James, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to come on and hopefully explain to both myself and some of the members in our audience what a BSO actually is. And for anyone who saw the LinkedIn post earlier today, we've had some suggestions, a Japanese soup, a British gravy, and I be can't so remember soup. the rest. Yeah, be, be so soup. So it is quite I interesting. But before we get onto that, quick thank you to everyone in the chat. Um, Carlos says that you're pumped, which is good. And please do keep the comments coming and please do drop the questions in as well. I want to try and make this interactive. So James, please give everyone a bit of background about who you are and where you've come from. Sounds like a chat show, that, but it isn't. Yeah, absolutely. So like you mentioned, I'm a BSO for a very AIML forward organization. I have been really, AI, cloud AIML sort of, bleeding edge tech forward organization. I have been very focused on the cloud security architecture and digital transformation space for the past five or six years. Um, stuff that I really enjoy doing. The digital transformation is all around us. It's very difficult because right when we're changing and transforming the technology that we're using to transform us is moving just as quickly. ChatGPT is a great example. New release after new release after new release. So I get a lot of joy out of helping sort of decipher that change and on, you know, out of being the bridge between different teams and breaking down silos, busting down silos and building bridges. That's that's my tagline. So the, the BSO role really works for me because it's a lot of that. So t tell me tell me how you got to here. So did you leave school thinking I'm going to be a BSO? 
or was was there a bit more to the journey than that? That's a that's a very interesting question. I don't know that the BSO rule the rule existed when I uh, left school. Yeah, any of those times when I was at school, James? Yeah, yeah, no way, no way. You know, I think it's interesting to think about how we got here. I know people are interested in, in what the BSO rule is. Yeah. So let's talk about how we got here in the first place. You see BSOs in very large and complex security organizations for a reason. Over time, as security organizations have gotten larger um, and more complex, and businesses have gotten larger and more complex through merger and acquisition, building out new lines of business, it's become more and more difficult for that single security organization to do a good job of giving each business segment the individual care and attention that they need. Large security organizations have sort of had to default to doing their best to create policies that are broad and that fit everything. And obviously, you know, my business segment is different than some of my peers' business segments, and they need different treatment. But how do you get the perspective from the business segment into the large security organization? And how do you make sure that your CISO in the large security organization understands what's going on with your business segment security posture? That's where the BSO comes in. We are that bridge in between the large security organization and the business segment that takes the business's needs into security and security's needs into the business. So when, so when we hear a lot of talk about CISOs to be on the board, um, I mean, a cu- couple of points around that. One tends to be fairly healthy stakeholders and shareholders who sit on the board. Um, yeah. I think at an executive level, absolutely. But you also hear a lot about CISOs having to learn extra skills that they haven't been used to and being able to communicate effectively to the board and understand right what the business MO is effectively. Right. So are, right. are you saying that in, in larger organizations, the CISOs don't have to do that so much? Is that where you bridge that gap or have I got that wrong? No, it's all right. So, you know, if you look at the stack, you've got the board, of course, and you've got the CISO and the CISO communicates up to the board and the BSO. Okay, right. CISO board. And then we're below that in between the CISO and the security or, or the, the CISO's organization and the business lines. Okay. So we are feeding up information from the business lines and, you know, making recommendations on security posture and policy that the CISO then feeds up to the board. In fact, recently I was working with my CISO to to uh, put together some board content for some stuff around my segment. So definitely on more on the consultant side as a BSO, that tends to be your role. We're not, you know, we're many CISOs in a way, but we don't have the authority or the budget of a CISO. But, uh, you know, we're not or, typically... Or the- all the responsibility and weight on your shoulders, or is it still there? Jeremy? I sleep really well at night for the most part, but that, that has a lot to do with the fact that I've got a good CISO, right? So, <laughs> yeah, good answer. I'll let, I'll let him stay awake. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Good answer. So talk me through an average day in the life of a BSO then. Oh, what does that even mean? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I, everyone does it differently. So not every BSO is as technically focused as I am. I like to say that every BSO is as different as the segments they support, which is great news for anybody who's interested in being a BSO because that means that you can bring a wide variety of skill sets to the role and just fit perfectly. For me, very technical and and you know cloud forward. So I spend a lot of time evaluating my my uh, segment security posture using automated tools and dashboards. And what I try to do is formulate an opinion about the environment, and I try to find areas for improvement. So I spend a lot, you know, maybe a third of my time trying to find things to fix. And a third of my time formulating that opinion and sharing that across the organization. And then a third of my time working directly with the business to understand exactly what they need from security. You know, what are your roadblocks? It can be as tactical as why has my change request been stuck in queue for three weeks to as you know technical as why do I have to use private endpoint, private link for this particular implementation of my AI ML tools. So that particular third is a lot of fun and involves a lot of change and a lot of negotiation then I, if, if you have, if, if you're going to put it together on an average day, I think that's what it looks like. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good point. Um, just had a question come in from Carlos. Let's bring that one up. Where are you, Carlos? I can find it. Here we go. What will the BSO position look like in five years? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you, Carlos. It's a great question because a lot of organizations are just getting started with the BSO role. And the way organizations have typically started is, you know what? My business needs some help. I need to better understand my business. I'm going to find people. I'm going to put them in that role. And I'm happy as long as my business is happy. That you know, that is a success criteria for most BSO programs at the beginning. BSO programs are beginning to mature. And in five years, they're going to have matured significantly. And I think that maturity path looks like going from if the business is happy, I'm happy, 
to is are my CISO and the business happy? And am I doing a good job of sharing my perspective on the security posture of my organization in both ways? So advocate, advocating for my business to the CISO, advocating for my CISO to the business. Yeah. To, you know, I think the next step of maturity is, am I doing a good job getting involved in things before they're happening? The hard part about being a BSO is that you've got to understand a large security organization and a large business segment at the same time. So it can be very difficult to be proactive. But the next level of maturity, and I think it has to do a lot with building relationships and building out processes, is being proactive. And I think in five years, once you've got those layers of maturity underneath you, the BSO is going to have the opportunity to be a lot stronger voice in the room and go, we, have, we certainly have a great voice in the room, but right now we're much more influencers and consultants. I think mature BSO organizations are going to start seeing teams being built out underneath them. And those teams are going to start to give them authority and scope to proactively make changes. So again, not being an expert, excuse this if it's a stupid question before I come on to the smart one that Arts just posted. So <laughs> a lot of the challenges you hear from CISOs and other leaders is the ability to ha- well, have the time to speak to everyone beneath them in the different departments to That's ensure right. that everything's running smoothly. Is that a big aspect of your job? Then it's it the, absolutely the, people, is. the people management and the relationship side? It is. The relationship side is critical. If, if you want to be a BSO, which is a great role, I don't see why you wouldn't. Make sure that your relationship building, your rapport building, and you know your negotiation skills and storytelling skills, all the things that make you personable and likable, make sure you're working on those skill sets on a regular basis because the most effective BSOs are the ones that are liked because your business line, if they like you, will come to you with things that they normally wouldn't. And your CISO will too. So yeah, the communication aspect is a huge, huge help, part of what I do to help my CISO understand what's going on across the organization. Okay. Sorry, I was distracted. Great I don't question. know if you can hear it, but my um, my two five-year-old twins are screaming downstairs. So I'm hoping this <laughs> mic isolates that sound. But Perfect. bear with me while I just close my studio door one second. Of course. Yeah. And stay out is how we say it. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Um, I've got a question, but I'm going to come back to that. Art's put a question in there. Um, hey, Art, good to see you. Thank you for coming yeah. to our San Francisco event, by the way, Art, last week. In a large organization with a lot of business segments or business units with different operations, whether they be subsidiaries or just diverse business units that have a supporting BSO reporting to a CISO, does your organization have something similar to a cyber steering committee that you are all in? Uh, we have several different subcommittees. So some of it is for managing privacy concerns and data, data concerns where the BSO has a consulting role. Some of it's from, uh, you know, we have committees for managing exceptions to policy, which is one of those things that come up a lot when you've got, like, like you mentioned, Art, sort of a diverse set of segments and subsidiaries. They all have different needs. And like I mentioned earlier, we're trying to fit a one-size policy to all of them. Lots of exceptions are going to come out of that, obviously. Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily have a single steering committee that the BSOs are on. But we, you know, what we do, and I think this is in, sort of in the vein of what you're talking about, our organization has a monthly get together where we, we exp- all of us get together and we talk about our segments to everybody who shows up. And that's sort of our steering committee for, if, if you will, for letting the organization know what's going on across segments, where you can steal ideas from, where there are pain points, and what direction we're choosing to go. I think that's does, about as close as that, we get. Does that sharing successes and sharing failures become a big part of that then? I think so. I think it's yeah. a big part of sort of the flywheel of, of success and sharing successes and failures makes organizations more authentic. And like I was saying just a second ago, the more authentic you are, the more people trust you and the more people trust you, yeah. the more likely they are to tell you where the bodies are buried, for lack yeah. of a better term. I love that. Love that expression. <laughs> um, Stuart, the policy wizard has jumped in with a question. Now, I don't know how you're going to ask it, answer this, because um, from what it sounds like, James, you've got the kind of perfect job there without the responsibilities of a CISO. But the question is, is it a good prep for a jump into security leadership or CISO role? Yes. So I think the BISO role is a security leader role. Um, generally, you've already got some leadership and people management experience, though not always. I do think it's a great pivot into the CISO role, or at least my fingers are crossed, because that's uh, ultimately that's my goal. 
that is, is to lead goal. a large security. Yeah. That is my goal. To you, lead a large you want, security you want those sleepless nights, really, James? I do. You know, listen, I've already had a, I've already had a kid and a toddler. I've had plenty of sleepless nights. What's one yeah. more, right? We've, we've already got it. It's fine. We've got the experience. That's um, right. I, I, I don't want that, so I applaud you. I applaud you for wanting that. I appreciate that. that. I may regret it when I get it. Yeah, right? you may. Well, I'll have you on my, when you're a CISO. We'll have you back and see if you've got gray hair like me. At that exactly. Point. You're going to see bags under the eyes. But yeah. to answer to answer the rest of the question, so the reason I think it's a great a piece of why it's great exposure to prepare you for a CISO role. First of all, if you're in a BSO organization, you probably work at a very large organization as it is. Yeah. So you are sort of the mini CISO for your segment. You've got the, you know, you've got the security view and you've got the business view. You can literally take that to a smaller organization. And I think you'd be pretty well ready. The other thing you won't be ready for is the board discussions, but I think with the right mentorship, you can learn that. Yeah. But I think the other thing that's interesting about the BSO role, and I'll leave it, I'll stop after this. I'm seeing CISOs go into BISO roles or BISO roles in other organizations to make career pivots. So if you want to work for a larger organization, you're coming from a smaller one, or you want to switch verticals, the BISO role is a great way to pivot into that. So I'm seeing a lot more of that as well. That's, that's a really good point. Um, I, don't, I think the question's come up, but it's one that I wrote down earlier. Is there such a thing as an ideal background for being a BISO? Do you, is, it, is it super important to have that hands-on technical experience or... Are the people yeah. and management skills more? What's, what's the most important parts or are they all equally important? It all, so it really depends on your segment. I think the thing that makes me an yeah. effective BSO in my, for my business segment would not make me an effective BSO for some of my peers' business segments. You know, organiz more business focused segments don't care as much about my technical skills. I think there are some things that you have in common if you're a BSO. I think you've got to be a skilled storyteller, a storyteller because you're telling the story of your segment to your CISO and the story of your security organization to your business organization. Um, you got to be a practice security strategist. So you do have to have a security background. I think you can come from just about anywhere in a security organization, though. I think if you come from you know, the SOC, great. You're going to have a lot of really interesting perspective. Security architecture and engineering, great. A lot of really interesting perspective. So I will say, if you've been on the technical side of things, the move to the BISO role, BISO role can be a little bit challenging because you're not actually delivering anymore. So that's yeah. one thing to look out for. And then I think the last thing you have to have is being big picture and long-term thinkers because you are trying to drive a security program over a very long period of time. I think I think it also, I mean, having not having done the role myself, but surely it's about what you enjoy doing on a daily basis and not being blinded by the fact I want to be a CISO or I want to be a B cell. Exactly. If, if you enjoy having your hands on a keyboard and getting into the weeds probably with not it, the right, yeah, it's yeah. Not, not, not the right role. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I think, I think our industry as a whole, you know, everyone looks up to everyone wants to be that CISO and I, I admire everyone who is, but I honestly don't believe it's a role for everyone. It's not for everyone. Yeah. It's very no. stressful. It's very, a lot of negotiation. Like we said, a lot of sleepless nights, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jacob, Jacob Friedman, who's been brave enough to volunteer to come on the show in two weeks' time. Met him in San Francisco last week. I'll just move you up to the top so this doesn't cut your chin off your face, um, like mine. Is there a pathway to becoming a BSO from the business side, or does one need to be that tenured security practitioner before making the bridge? I think there is a pathway from the business side. Uh, the pathway, I think, is a little more narrow, frankly. I think the pathway is probably if you're in a, if you're on the business side in a business segment, you have a great opportunity of moving into the BSO role within your segment because you've got the trust of your yeah. entire side of the business. Um, if you don't have a security background at all, I think it's going to be a little bit more challenging. But what I'm seeing and what what to brag a little bit about what Humana is doing, we're starting to build out a pod structure. So most organizations I work for, flat organization of BSOs reporting into business risk or the CISO. Yeah. So my boss is starting to build out pods where we've got, you know, the BSO being very strategic and then, you know, lower level of BSOs who are, they're sort of BSOs in waiting, if you will. They're BSOs, but they're more focused on the tactical. They're more focused on gathering data and helping the, the BSO for the segment, um, you know, build out their perspective on the security posture of the program. That is a great way. If you can find an organization that's doing that to move from the business into the BSO role and get on the fly security training. Yeah, it makes, makes absolute sense. Arts just said, sounds like due to the compliance and policy exceptions, GRC background is probably good to have. I think we GRC agree. is great. Definitely it is. Definitely so, is. So do you think you yeah. could you could come from a GRC background without kind of the coding and the other experience that some people have? You yeah. think that would still work, yeah? I do. You know, it, again, it depends on your segment. If, if your segment needs you to be technical and if you spend a lot of time 
working with engineers who are tired of your software development processes, then that's not going to be a great fit. But yes, there are plenty in, in my organization. There are plenty of BSO roles where GRC is a really strong skill set. So how many, how many BSOs do you have within your organization? And are you looking to recruit any at the moment is going to be the next question that comes into the chat. So I'm just preempting that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think we are up to nine now. Wow. Because we've, yeah, it's significant. And then we've got another sort of subset of, we've got a, a few subsidiaries that are, they've got their own small programs. So if you include them, which I would, because we all do pretty similar things, I think we're up to 12. And I think we've got a couple of roles posted for information security officers. So have you? Yeah, careers.humana.com. Come check I, um, I, out. Let's, let's, let me find that website. And I'll be able to um, interview you. <laughs> a, a, friend, a friend of mine is looking for a role at the moment. Whereabouts is Humana based? Uh, we're out of Louisville, but you know, there's there's a lot of opportunities for remote. Louisville, Kentucky. There's a lot of opportunities for remote work. Okay, and, in the and talk to me area. to put this in context then, James. Um, the size of Humana, yeah. how big an organization is it? I think we're up to 80,000 now. We're a Fortune 42 company now. Okay. So we're it's it's a sizable organization. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's somewhere between 60 and 80,000. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm trying not, to do exactly two things at sure. once then. It, it never it never works, does it? <laughs> I love it. I appreciate the, appreciate the recruiting help. Yeah, no worries. Um, Richard, good friend of mine. Uh, very interesting background. If you haven't connected with Brainstorm Security here, I suggest that you do. Um, he's told us about red teaming Absolutely. some diplomats around the world, which was very, very interesting. Sick. I think Richard and I are connected. Are you? Though. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that, Richard. Yeah. 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 Cheers. He's, he's such a good guy. Um, what percentage of your work is reactive? This might be a test question. He's tricky, oh, Richard. What percentage of your work is yeah. reactive and proactive? My work in particular, probably 60% proactive. And the only reason for that is because my organization is so cloud focused and I've got lots of tools at my disposal and I've got lots of cloud knowledge that I can use to identify signals that means. Can I, can I play devil's advocate there and say it's probably a lot to do with your own time management skills, James? That's also true. Yeah. You know, I do, I do time blocking, I, you know, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, but it, I, I try to keep it proactive. Um, a lot of my work is also longer term. So proactive over the bigger picture, though in the micro, while I'm building out sort of that long-term plan, reactive things have to happen. Yeah, of course. So, well, I, just, I don't know if that makes sense. No, it, yeah. does, it does. It makes absolute sense. I'm actually thinking about it. If anyone's interested, I want to encourage some more questions in the chat. I've got two free accesses to World of Haiku Pro, which is um, a gamified learning experience for cybersecurity. I'll give them away to the two best questions that come in. So keep the questions coming in and we'll do a little, we'll do a little draw at the end. Um, Elsa, That's nice cool. to see you. Asked a good question here. What's the most challenging part of your role? And more importantly, yeah. how do you tackle it? That's a great question. I think the most challenging part of the BSO role, and I got, you know, I when I was first coming into this role, I was looking for what's good and what's bad about the BSO role. And I, before I say this, I just want to say I got the idea really from Return on Security. I don't remember the author's name, but he's got this great article about the trouble with the BSO role. And the one thing that sticks out to me is we have a lot of responsibility and generally very little authority because of where we sit in the organization. So to me, that's that can be very challenging because you, you when you know there's a problem, you can't really tell somebody. But this this is where this is where the relationship building skills come and in. That's it. Yeah. When you build build exactly. trust with your team, whether it's up or down, it suddenly starts to remove those barriers. But again, not having that's done exactly the role. Right. But yeah. No, but you're absolutely right. And I think you've probably seen that in a lot of other roles, even outside of security, yeah. right? When you're dealing with human beings. And, you know, dealing with people, that's one of the critical skills that you have to have. And, and also that's how I tackle it as well. I build my relationships. When you become a senior leader, a lot of senior leaders sort of focus their relationships on their layer. I don't do that. Yeah. You know, I try to solve problems all the way down the stack. That way I've got, you know, if I need it, and it's not really selfish. I really just like solving these problems. But what, what ends up happening is you build relationships everywhere. And if you, you can find somebody that will help you get things done, if it's important enough. Yeah, completely. I mean... For me, it's the only thing I'm any good at is the relationship bit. So I'm going to be a big advocate of that. But it's very if you, winning, winning hearts and minds of anyone, you know, whether it's in your organization, within your friendship group, it immediately builds that trust. And it is, you know, if you haven't got that skill and you're looking to get into any leadership role in any industry, I'd highly suggest it is something you can practice and it is something that you can learn, even if you're introverted and it doesn't come naturally. With, with anything, right. you know, I, I learned to code and I'm the least technical person in the world. And yes, it is a bit clunky and it's very painful to watch, but you can, but it gets it done. But it is, it is done again. I'll just 
kind of want to give people hope out there who are introverted that you can change that and you can you can improve it um yeah and you know the easiest step do something for someone else yeah. without asking for anything in return. there we go just start there yeah. and do that a bunch scale that yeah and watch how well that pays do, off. do you know um i had get the name right leanne potter um on i think it was last week she's the anthro securist so she comes from an anthropology background interesting. It, it is super interesting because yeah she's taking the whole building out security teams and making them effective from a completely different perspective and it it all goes back and she was telling me this to when there was different tribes where this has all come from to build those relationships with different tribes we used to give them gifts and the yeah. story she said to me was she said what's the second thing you think of as soon as someone gives you a present she said the first thing is oh this is amazing thank you so much it's lovely but the next thing is i got to give them a gift yeah and, and how am i going to beat it <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> and and if you if you put that into the business context, it's exactly the same. You don't exactly. you don't have to. I mean, chocolates, cookies, and cakes do work. But if you can reach, we've all seen Ted Lasso here. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. Come on. But if if you can reach out and help someone else with a problem that they've got without that kind of expectation of having something back, that's where you really start to build. I think strong strong relationships. Anyway, I'm rambling. I need to get yeah. back to these. Questions. No, but you're right. You're right. And you're passionate about that, which I, I, I am. I am passionate about that because I've seen I've seen the power of relationships and I've, I've seen what it can do. And I've also seen some very, very smart people struggle in not only in this industry, but in financial services as well, who probably were the smartest people in the room. But because of their inability to build relationships and maintain relationships, their careers stagnated. And yeah. I'd also say there's some people in fairly high powered jobs who perhaps haven't got as much skills as the people below them but the skill they have got is the ability to win people over that's right yeah right i think you're absolutely right about that. right richard another question from you do you have any particular techniques it's not thumb screws with your police background richard any particular techniques that you use to persuade or influence the board on your opinions or findings chocolate so i might re yeah, that's right. So I, at the BSO level, you don't get a lot, you don't get any board exposure, just to be clear. So who I'm trying to influence is my CISO. How do I get my CISO to share my message to the board? The good news is, you know, having a relationship with your CISO is really critical. Like, just like we were talking about, you have to have that trust in the first place. So that's very helpful. And buy, and buy them but good birthday for, presents. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I think for my relationship with my CISO, what he values is clarity of thought, very clear path from where we were, how we got to where we are, to where we're going, and being very data-driven and trying to take the opinion out of it, right? I mean, there's opinion in everything yeah. when you're in a consulting type role, but as little as possible. And I think if I can give him concrete data, concrete story, and a concrete outcome, you know, what we, what we expect and how we're going to get there, um, that's how I get him to move my message up. Yeah. No, that makes makes absolute sense. Um, find the next question. Great question, by the way, Richard. It was, it was a great question. Like I said, great guy. Um, it's a, here we go. Good question again. Who's the most success? Ah, let's just talk about the definition of success here quickly before we read this question out. Yeah. So I got that very wrong, um, what I thought success was for about 30 years. Yeah. So I'll ask the question now, framing it with that in mind. Who's the most successful person you know that's in this role? And what do you think it is that makes them successful? Yes. So I'm going to pick somebody who I look at as sort of the pioneer of the BISO role, Alisa Miller. Uh, she is a CISO now for, I think, S&P. But the way that she's sort of driven the BISO role forward and the way that she's made it more public and accessible, I think has been incredibly valuable. If you look at her blog, I think it's alisamillerblog.com. <laughs> I've been there once or twice. A lot of great tips on, you know, first of all, she gave me the definition in my head of what Abiso was in the first place. She's got a lot of other great stories about, you know, how she builds influence and how she manages security programs. I look at her as successful because she got the role that I'm looking for, right? So she, not only did she build out the sort of the Biso brand and make it more popular, but she ended up exactly where I'm looking to get. Don't know her personally, but I've been watching from afar and definitely really good example. Well, there we go. There is the link. Look at me doing two things at once. The link to Alyssa's blog. Um, Carlos has made a good point saying it's cliched, but no one cares what you know until they know how much you care. Love that, Carlos. That's absolutely. Good. That really, really. Is. Another Ted Lasso fan, I'm sure. Of it. Yeah. Oh, he, I know for a fact he is. Yeah. I shared a shared an apartment with Carlos, Steve Hindle, who's a CISO, and Steve's wife last week when we were in San Francisco 
because we yeah. I, I refused to pay the, the going or couldn't afford to pay the going rates for the hotels over there. It's ridiculous. Didn't, didn't know the area, right? <laughs> Found somewhere on Airbnb for less than a hundred dollars a night, and um, you were in the tenderloin. We then. were n- not not quite because that's the only area I did know that I blocked off the map. But we were in Oakland <laughs> for anyone who knows that. Oh, you guys were East Bay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Long drive in. Mm-hmm. Well, we were on the BART, which wasn't too bad. Although at nighttime, it was Fair. extremely interesting. But yes, it was um, <laughs> It was a, a strange decision. To say the least. Yeah, we'll, we'll, leave, it, we'll leave it there. Um, yeah. Justin has asked a question that Art kind of brought up a little bit, and he's followed it up at the top here. He said, how can our security programs, tooling and training fulfill the CIA triad without digital accessibility? And Art's comment was, I'm not sure you can never fulfill the CIA triad, similar to the way you can never really be secure. It's a matter of measuring risk. And then Justin put, I'll bring this up as our field, as our field not really accessible to those with disabilities, although many, many yeah. countries have laws saying they should be. And that is a great point, Justin. Yeah, it is. Any thoughts it is. On I'm that? afraid I, I don't have a great answer for that, but you're right. I, that's, an, that's an incredible challenge. It is, yeah. Okay. We, it's not something we've done a good job of uh, in industry in tech in general of resolving. No, I think I think the whole diversity piece um, is a lot of noise about it, but yeah, it, but not a lot of action. No, if you look over the years, yeah. there's not, and yeah. the not, not just race or sex or disability. It's also a lot no. of ageism. As well. Neurodiversity. Yeah, ageism. I mean, a- ageism is definitely alive and well. Jed, who's had to jump out of this because he's got a meeting in his local town hall. Jed's a few years older than myself. He's worked in the healthcare industry for like thirty years tons yeah. and tons of experience he'd make an i think he'd make an excellent BSO with his technical knowledge but he just keeps getting doors slammed in his face and it it pains me to see that that someone with his experience and everything that he has to bring to an organization has to go through that so if anyone else is going through yeah. something similar my comment would be come and join the infosec live community there's four thousand of us now all trying to support each other and everyone's more than welcome so, listen by and large your next job is going to be given you know you're going to be connected to that job by somebody that knows and trusts you. Yeah. No, absolutely. Again, so it's, build, it's build, that, build those relationships. It's all about building up that network. Justin, um, you've got a webinar coming up so I can share. Humble plug. Share away. Drop the link in the chat and we'll get it shared for you. More than happy to. And I'll make sure if I can, if I'm not sat on a plane, I'll definitely tune in for that one. Okay. Next question. Oh, it's getting depressing now. From Emmanuel Appiah. Please, what was your lowest moment as a BSO? Lowest moment. Oh, I am an overwhelmingly positive thinker. And I look at low moments as lessons. Uh, le- learning opportunities, James. Learning opportunities. Let me see. That is a big question. It is a big question. Yeah. Hmm. I will give you a, an answer that has nothing to do with my time as a BSO. But how about this? I'll tell you about a big, the biggest mistake I've probably made in my career was or the, the most impactful mistake. When I was at Google, I was responsible for protecting Google's OAuth APIs. And uh, I accidentally blocked the free press from being able to post to, to YouTube. And then when we fixed the problem, I did it again. So <laughs> the lesson I learned there was that uh, blameless po- postmortems are wonderful. <laughs> I love that. Know your customer a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. And that one small mistake can have a very uh, scaled impact. But the, the BSO role for well, what me did, has what, been what pretty, positive, pretty positive. What positive did you get out of that, though? Because it must have helped you. Because if you're anything like me, when, when we have failures or adversity, at the time it seems like the worst point in your life. But I look back a few years to when I had my lowest point back in 2019. Yeah. I learned more then. It certainly didn't seem like it at the time. But I learned more then about yeah. who I was, how to deal with problems than I have on any anything I've succeeded at. Absolutely. I think that the big lesson for me there was to be First of all, patient with myself and others, because there was a lot of frustration. Yeah. Google has the blameless postmortem philosophy, but it doesn't always feel that way. Yeah. So learning how to take criticism without feeling like you're being hit over the head was pretty critical. And then just being more reflective in general. I now do pre-mortems and postmortems for any major activity that I'm going to undertake, even if it's just me doing it. You know, what could go wrong and then what did go wrong? And that's a great way to learn. Did I screw up where I thought I would? Was I able to screw up where I expect or avoid screwing up where I expected to? All very good questions, um, even outside of the BSO role, just sort of your day-to-day life, even as a parent. <laughs> How can I screw my kid up? And, and did I avoid it? <laughs> I've got I've got six children. I'd like to think that numbers five and six are slightly better being brought up better than number <laughs> one right. was. 
you've gotten better and better and better. That's right. See, I don't know about the, and if not, the tolerance, part, post-mortem. The tolerance part hasn't come yet. I think I'm getting to be a grumpy old man, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, nothing wrong no. with that. Okay, next question. Could you suggest some resources from Cloud BSO <laughs> perspective? Be helpful, BSO, to empower to access, assess cloud security posture and enforce cloud security controls. Could you perhaps suggest automated tools to assess cloud security posture? Yes, I will plug myself, cloudbso.com. I haven't published there very, very oh, much lately. If you pop it in the private it... chat, I can put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I've got some interesting starts to content about being a BSO on the cloud. And then for the tooling and stuff, all really depends on your environment. If you want to find me on LinkedIn, we can have a little LinkedIn chat and I can dive in. All depends on your budget. There's lots of free stuff, uh, but it also depends on what cloud you're in. Like, you know, Prowler is great for AWS, but if you're in GCP, maybe not so much. So it's all very environment and need dependent, but really happy to discuss that with you. Thanks, James. I'm just going to find your yeah, of course. LinkedIn and type your LinkedIn profile link. And I've just seen someone in the audience that I'm very, very excited to see and haven't spoken to for too long. Hold on one second. I can't do two things at once. So that is James's LinkedIn profile. Jack Scott, amazing to see you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you're anywhere near Virginia or anywhere in Virginia next week, I'm over from Tuesday until Saturday and it would be amazing to catch up. If not, let's catch up on a call soon. Sorry, personal bit out of the way there. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. Okay, next question. Bear with me. You can see that I need glasses, can't you? <laughs> I keep getting closer and it doesn't get any better. Okay, I've got I've got a question for you. I've written some down here. I can't if you put a question in and I've missed it, please drop it in again. Okay. So you you, you answered this a little bit earlier. You were talking about which is something I've learned from our discussion today, that you have different business areas covered by different BSOs. Yeah. So the question I want to ask is, could a BSO for a large organization like Humana, we talked about stepping from kind of career pivots, is that a good way to go to a smaller firm if you want to take that CISO route? And again, second yes. part to that question if your knowledge was very focused on one area, say it's cloud or DevOps or whatever it might be, is that going to hinder you becoming a CISO and do you need to learn anything else? There's about five questions there for you, James. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I think the definitely yes to the first one. That's my belief. I've seen that pivot several times. I think uh, Alyssa Miller is a good example, although she went to, I think, a relatively large organization. So that tells you everything you need to know about the, the pivotability of the PISO role. So smaller or larger, I think there's a lot of potential. But going when it comes to the skill set, if you if you've got a DevOps skill set, that's pretty broad. Yeah. At the end of the day, it all comes down to the story you tell about your capabilities and how you match your capabilities to the job at hand. And if you've got broad capabilities in exciting spaces that people really care about, like cloud and DevOps, I don't think you're ever going to find yourself, um, you know, pigeonholed. Great way to look at the way you build your career out is learn platforms over specifics. Okay, what well, I think just, DevOps. Just to expand on that a bit more by the all the meaning of platforms, James. For people like yeah, me who so, don't understand. Of course. So look at cloud. Now, what is what really is cloud? It is a platform of a bunch and a bunch of technologies that you can build on top of. Every platform, every grouping of technologies has basics. You know, every cloud service provider has IAM. Every one of them has compute. Every one of them has databases. You can learn those core technologies, how to put them together, how to secure them, what makes them break, and what makes it difficult for the business to use them. You can pivot into any subsection, any niche of cloud that you want to. If you've got those building blocks, you can go into AIML because everything's built on those building blocks in the cloud, right? Yeah. From then, it's just learning domain context. So I'm a big believer in... I think I look at DevOps as it's a little bit more domain specific, but it's still a platform because everybody does DevOps differently. And DevOps lets you pivot into MLOps, yeah. which is, you know, it's, it's about delivering value automatedly, repeatably, and measurably, right? So if you learn those big concepts, you're never going to be, I don't think you're really ever going to be pigeonholed. The question is, how well can you tell your story? And how well can you convince the people in the interview that uh, you're a fit? Yeah, no, brilliant. There's... Um question here that kind of relates to that chinadu says i guess this is a google question um but is the career path to be so for someone changing from a business or sorry 
what is the career path to being a BSO for someone changing from a business and client management career? I think you may have just answered that in what you've just said, but I'll let you address it. Yeah. So we're talking maybe like a sales executive account manager level. Think think so. That's yeah. the, yeah, that's sort of the, the idea that I get. So I know you may be able, okay. One thing to consider, there are lots of different types of organizations out there with lots of different needs, right? I'm a BSO at a healthcare company. That's a bank's going to have different needs. You know, I think the, the, the first thing you do is find an organization that needs your skill set, right? So if you're in account management or, you know, pre-sales engineering, pretty much you can fit pretty much anywhere, but there are going to be niches that you can better serve. I think you find that skill set. And then from there, you've got to find your way into the organization in the first place. I think going straight into a BSO role might be tough. But if you find an organization that's experimenting with the BSO role and just building out their BSO program, that might be a way in as well. Okay. Well, what, what sorry, would that's be, not a straight answer. But. What, no, it's a great answer. <laughs> um, what would be a role that you could go into before being a BSO from that background then? Let's take it a step back. Yeah. So going into, I mean, I think program management um, is probably a great pivot in. Product management is probably a great pivot in. The tech companies look at program and product management a little bit different than most companies do. So I think outside of the tech companies, especially, you have a great opportunity to go from account management into program or product management because you know what it takes to deliver value. Yeah. You know the value stream and you know how to build relationships. And I think you do that, especially if you can get into a security organization. From there, you build relationships inside your security organization and across business lines. And then you found you will find a way to pivot into the BSO role if you really want it. It could just take some time, but I think program and product manager are pretty fun as it is. Yeah. So no, I appreciate that. And get, going back to what you were saying earlier about the different experiences and how they relate, my 17-year-old son's just finishing his technology levels, and he'd kind of been he's been doing his work experience at Aviva <clears throat> here in Norwich in the oh, UK. Cool. Yeah, and they'd kind of promised him um, the cybersecurity apprenticeship role without before he went through the whole process and it turns out they've had like 3,000 applications for this this is the first time they've ever put this junior role out there he hasn't got the role but they offered him a different role in the mainframe department and yeah. he's turned it down why he's turned it down because he said but dad I wanted to get into security and I didn't have, not having the experience or the knowledge that you and most of the guests or, or the people watching here do, I didn't have the right answer for him for that. So maybe I could yeah. get you to have a chat with him, James, at some point. Because of course. I really think it would be, it'd be good for him I'd to get his to. foot in the door, at least. That's a miss. Does he still have that opportunity? Yeah, does. Okay. I, I would take that opportunity for sure. Right. And here's why. Companies are modernizing either out of mainframes or they're modernizing around their mainframes first. So there's going to be a lot of work for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And second of all, how do you expect to secure something if you don't understand 100%, it? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't start in security. I started in software development and then went into, and you know, engineering and architecture practices yeah. and then moved into security. I'm not saying you have to do that, but I think it's a really advantageous way to get into the security field, having that knowledge first. Otherwise people are just, I don't know. They're just looking at, they're taking a chance. Uh, on I, me, I, which I, is can, I could not fine. agree more. I mean, I, I tried to become uh, too, putting too much luck into the equation. You know yeah. what I mean? You need to take, you need to rely less on luck and have some hard skills that you can bring to the table. Yeah. Rich is saying get your foot in the door. And I think I'm a great example of how, how not to try and break into the industry being a pen tester with no experience in networking. Yeah, but well, and it made it harder. It, well, it, but... Yeah, it, I ended up coming in from a completely different route unexpectedly, but it, I did waste a lot of time studying for OSCP yeah. that I'm clearly never going to be able to pass in my life. So. Yeah, that is such, listen, that is a difficult exam for even people who have been doing it for a long time. Yeah. Try harder. Yeah, must must try harder. Just <laughs> try oh, harder. I felt, I felt like saying, you pay all this money out for the labs and you get like the help desk people yep. to talk to. They're not helpful. Oh, right. They're not helpful. Well, they, no. are, they are helpful. Try harder. They are helpful yeah. because they're trying to guide you. But if you don't actually know what it is they're telling you or understand what it is going on underneath the bonnet, to use a car analogy, That's you're right. absolutely screwed, aren't you? So, absolutely. Um, I think we've got a fan or one of your mentees in here but it doesn't say Ooh. their name. So LinkedIn user, um, first off said, operations management in a smaller tech startup can also help lead into InfoSec. It's a great point. The type of situation where it's part of a bigger role, you learn on the job out of necessity. And then food for thought, continue to follow James on LinkedIn and absorb his wall to understand how to become a B. So I consider him my coach. So whoever that is, please drop your name in. Um, so James can send you money through the post later. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. It turned my bribery. See, bribery still works. <laughs> bribery and corruption. Yeah, absolutely works. <laughs> That's right. Um, okay, Carlos, question from you. Bombshell of a question. <clears throat> Holding his breath. Well, you put it up there five minutes ago, so you've either passed out or you've taken a breath now, Carlos. Will the CISO role ever be absorbed by the business? Kind of how IT has been, meaning responsibility yep. distributed among business units. Wonderful question. And this is actually something that I've been trying to convince people is going to happen for a while. Yes. That's what shift left is all about. Yeah. If you're going to be getting security closer to the code, that means you need to put security people close to the code. Yeah. So I think I, in 10 years, I think larger security organizations are going to start to flatten out. They're going to become more operational um, and strategic, and they're going to become more about monitoring and responding. And you're going to see a lot of things like AppSec, um, things that are closer to the technology, you're going to see those moved into the business. I think the CISO role is still going to be very important because CISO is still going to have to drive the organization's strategy and policies. And they're still going to need architecture teams to set architecture standards. But, you know, definitely going to see flattening and more of that shift left means more people shifting into the business. It's a great question, Carlos. It is, very, it is uh, a great question. Good foresight. And it's... Yeah, good, good it, foresight. It's great foresight, especially for bigger organizations. I suppose my, my flip to that comment would be the small to medium business sector is way behind on adopting yeah. security mindsets and policies and procedures how do you see that shift happening because let's be honest the smb sector can't afford um a bso for every different business unit and at the moment they probably can't no. even even afford a cso either so yeah. you've got the fractional kind of cso arrangement the vc so exactly well, the vc so do you think that's going to be the answer for these smaller businesses moving forward and if so have you got any stock tips for me to invest in yes i think if you look at the big four you see lots of vc so opportunities yeah. lots of uh lots of talent there so um, you know i think the vc so role is a very interesting one the fractional CISO role because from my perspective if i were to take that role and i could learn a whole lot about a whole bunch of different business lines very quickly and then from the business that I'm working with perspective, they get a whole bunch of experience packed into a very small, quick package that they've only got to pay for one time, right? You don't have to build out an entire security program. So yeah. I think the VCSO thing is going to continue. Maybe my friend Carlos will create the VBSO at some point. It could, could well do. Great guy, Carlos, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, um, we found out who your mentee is, Imran. Hey, Imran. There you go. Thank you. Ah, what are you talking about? We're peers, sir, but I appreciate thank, you. You're very kind. Thank you, Imran. I really appreciate you jumping in. <laughs> Um, Justin's made a good point here that I want to stick on for a little bit. So, and we're going to need directors and managers that are technical. Completely agree. I think that is a great point. Okay. Because, well, let's, I, let's, let's yeah. address this point because having that step from being technical hands on keyboard, if you haven't had the exposure to the board, or the understanding of the business, the relationship skills, is there a pathway or can you help point people in the right direction of any resources? that can help with that transition. So transitioning from more technical yes, to, to kind of more... leadership. Yeah. So, so there are lots of ways to do it. I chose the MBA route. Don't have to do that. I think there are a lot of options. It's a good, still a good um, route, still a good route though. Yeah, it is. And the reason, so I learned a ton from the program yeah. also made a lot of wonderful connections. I think the key comes down to though, finding mentors who will help. So what are you going to do to find mentors? For me, the MBA route was a, big factor in that because going to UT, I've got access to a really solid community, global community and people that'll help me at any time. Yeah. Yeah. Biz degree, you know, find, I guess you, you need to find a tribe that has a layer that wants to help out. It's very difficult to do this on your own. And the reason it's difficult is because, you know, we talk about the idea of a board as if it's sort of a, a homogenous entity. Every board is completely oh, different. Absolutely. Yeah. And every board is composed of people from different companies with different perspectives and different skill sets. There is no one board. So to, be, to get better with my board, I'm looking to my CISO to teach me about that board in particular. You know what I mean? So I guess my point is the mentor-mentee relationship is critical. Put yourself in a position where you have a lot of opportunities to get a lot of good mentorship. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think um, understanding how the business makes money is, is a great starting point if you haven't ever looked at that before and you know if, if you yeah. then set your heart on leadership in a certain type of organization or a certain type of industry have a look to see what the mo is of that organization what what, what is their reason for existing other than to pay the shareholders right. how do they make that profit and i think if you always keep that in your mind no matter what you're doing with your role you, you can't go too far wrong um 
Yeah, you'll be well off. Uh, I think it might be Imran again here who said, where is it? Someone who went from a large organisation to an SMB, I 100% agree. VB so, here we go. Here we go. See? Hey? See? This is, Come on, Carlos. Uh, Carlos, you need to start registering the domain name for this one, vbso.com. <laughs> Get it in there. Um, oh, do do you think then we'll see on the outsourcing piece, yeah, as Justin said, understanding how what you do supports that company's mission, much more eloquently put. Thank right. you, Justin. Um, and going back to your point earlier, Justin, about people with disabilities, for anyone who has a problem with their hearing, which is about as much as I can help with, if you watch this on LinkedIn, I've enabled the transcript to, to help nice. with that. So you can actually watch the text on there. I don't know how good it is and how much it works. I have reached out to YouTube to see if it's available. At the moment, it isn't. But as soon as it is, I'll make sure it's switched on on here as well. Okay, next question. Jax is skiving from work, enjoying listening while working. I hope we get to catch up next week, Jax. That would be awesome. Um, so VBSO as a service, let's talk about that for a moment. Is it a thing? If yeah. not, shall we start one? Yeah, so I, here's uh, here's what I've seen. I've seen big four consulting firms build out BSO programs inside their programs. Here's what I think the challenge is with the VBSO role. To be good as a BSO, you have to understand your business segment. Yeah. If you look at the big four firms, They've got that because what they tend to do is they work with the same company over and over across different different business lines and di solving different problems. So if you stick a BSO in with this, you know, I worked at KPMG for a while. They just got so much data about the companies that they work for, projects, budgets, people, all of it. That makes a lot of sense. You can plug somebody into that role, teach them very quickly about the segments they're supporting and sort of move them around that business. Great for you as a firm as well, because you've got somebody that's advocating for yeah. you across multiple business lines. Starting that program from scratch, and you know, if we were to, if Carlos and I were to start a VBSO program today, hold on, hold on, where, where are my shares? <laughs> Simon, we'll 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 send you a safe Thanks. for the fifty percent. Lovely, discount. I mean, I'm in. <laughs> you know, how how do we know about the business segments that we're going to be supporting? I guess the obvious start is to go to places that you've worked before. Yeah. I say maybe maybe if you're in the financial services sector, you focus on providing VBSO services for the finance sector. Yeah, and then yeah, I guess and then so. I suppose this is me <laughs> thinking out loud and trying to grab some shares before you do this, and then you could look at recruiting people from different industries and different sectors to then build that out and scale that out. Right so the thing is, here. though, yeah, exactly. Well, the transcript is going to help a lot, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, yeah. we're, we're nearly out of time. So, last question isn't a question. It's any words of advice for anyone out there looking to become a BSO. What would it be? Yes, uh, people skills are critical. Work on your storytelling skills. Know how to tell a story from beginning to middle to end. Make it meaningful, and learn how to connect with people in a way that makes them. I think it was Maya Angelou. I'm going to paraphrase. People don't, they'll forget what you say, but they'll remember how you make them feel. So critical in the BSO role. Yeah. Outside of the people skills, um, you know, brush up on your security skills. Have a good story about why you've got enough security knowledge and business knowledge to fit into this role. And, you know, work on that plan. In the meantime, try a whole bunch of different stuff. You don't, you know, the BSO role is outstanding. What's great about it is that just about anybody can fit into it. So build a really cool background. Go experiment and try different things at different companies. You know, be, have some successes, some wins, and make some impact. And you'll find your way to the BSO role if that's what your heart really wants. Love that. And, be and, before, and before we wrap things up, um, <laughs> Justin's put a free tip in there, which I think is a very, very good one. Watch the sales training calls and training. Most of the time, this is built to be consumable by most and helps you get a peek into the business side. Great point. And we've just had one yeah. more question come in and I want to address it because William Welch, thank you so much for joining the community and becoming a member of our YouTube channel. It really does mean a lot. And if anyone else would like to do that, there are three options available and it will help me buy a shirt to go with my suit. So it'd be much appreciated. <laughs> um, the last Simon for the next bond. I'm too old, mate. I'm far too old. Uh, Never. Any, any advice for a cybersecurity consultant interview from William Welch? Let's cover that one off before we go if you've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, you know what? Uh, what if you're planning? If you're looking for your interview style, try Star. A lot of the tech companies use that. Amazon, in particular, is a real big situation, task, action, result. Um, what you're going to be your your interview is going to be looking for is: Do you know how to define a problem? 
Do you know how to break that problem up into parts? Do you know what to do with those parts? And do you know how to share your success afterwards? So that's a, that is a great that's, way that's to go back about to the storytelling a little bit as well, isn't it? Oh, it is. That's exactly what it is. I found a, you know, I found a link. Shape. I don't know how good it is class. here, but it's a haze link for how to utilize the star method. So hopefully that might help. Yeah. I love it. And then go to Glassdoor, look at Amazon's interview questions. They use almost all. Um, I, I can't believe I can't think of the word for this type of interviewing style all of a sudden. Behavioral interviewing. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Man, people will use yeah. those questions over and over across interviews. So, you know, pick some star stories, map them to those behavioral questions, practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Um, and would you say, um, make sure you look through the spec of what it is for when you first apply for the job and look at those key words and key points that they want for you to conduct that role Absolutely. or the abilities do you have and make and sure you've got stories. When you have gaps. Yeah. Yes. And when you have gaps, be ready to explain how you have filled other gaps in your life. I wasn't good at A. So I, went, and I, went, I did B I and C for three years. That's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the answer, I love it. by the way. James. Yeah, but well, it could be. It's so sorry. Go on. No, I kid. Thank you. So um, much. No, thank Alex Venter. Thank you for tuning in as well. There's so many of you in there that I haven't seen for a long time. David Molam as well. And again, the chat has been on fire. James, this has been one of the most insightful and engaging sessions I've had for a long time. Thank you so, so much. Let's catch up again off camera at some point, um, get some hints and tips Absolutely. for you. I'd really appreciate it. And for everyone who's tuned in, massive thank you for your engagement as always. Back, when am I back? Not next week, I'm in Washington DC next week. So no live streams, but back the week after for a fairly busy week. Please check out the schedule and see you all really, really soon. Take care.